Hi, I'm Ken Fisher. Welcome to the 19th season of Citywide. My guest on this edition of Citywide is Dan Biederman, the man behind the remarkable success of Bryant Park in Manhattan. So much more. Welcome to Citywide, Dan. Thanks for having me, Ken. For almost 30 years, you have been the impresario of the restoration of a lot of great public spaces uh, in New York and other cities around the, uh, around the country. Um, but it all goes back to Bryant Park. So it's a public square, uh, not a lot of trees next to the main branch of the public library, 5th Avenue and 42nd Street. Uh, 28 years ago, uh, it was a place that you only went if you wanted to get mugged or buy drugs. Um, what happened after that? First, I got the great opportunity to turn it around, Ken, because of the Rockefeller family who decided that it, you couldn't have a space that dangerous and uh, dirty and everything else next to the New York Public Library. And we came up with a strategy that involved a political view and a public space view. The public space view came from the work of William H. White, Jr., who was one of my mentors, who said, if you give people somewhere to sit and give them attractive greenery and what we eventually began to call programming, events going on, things to do, people would come. And on the political side, we decided we needed some separation from the city of New York. So this is a privatization. Uh, the public doesn't really sense it. There are no signs up saying this is a private space. Most people think it's a conventional public park. Uh, but it's all financed by the private sector. There's not a dollar of city money since 1997 that goes into Bryant Park. And that gives us some more leeway in terms of terms of employment, business deals, and on the revenue side, a lot more freedom to bring in revenue that defrays the cost to the everyday user of Bryant Park. Talk a little bit about the change in the design because there were physical changes to the space that were not just about maintenance or aesthetics. They were modest though. Uh, Paul Goldberger at, at the time of the New York Times said, you got to rip this place down and start over. And I said, Paul, that's a landmark. I can't. So we m put some new entrances in. We made some breaches in the balustrade so you could enter the lawn. So there weren't as many dead ends. But we didn't spend much money. It was four and three quarters million dollars in 1989 dollars. So most of the changes really, Ken, were, were programming, management, and financing. Well, for example, I remember, I remember when, when you did this, you put in movable chairs at a time when anything movable in New York was likely to get stolen. Yeah, everybody said those will disappear tomorrow, and we knew they wouldn't. And they're now 5,800. We have no pilferage at all. Nobody dares to take a chair from Bryant Park. Um, there were models elsewhere. The Queen did this in uh, St. James Park. Uh, they were for rent and they never disappeared. So we knew what could happen here and lo and behold, um, it's one of the symbols of the fact that this is a space with social order. Well, speaking of that, you know, I'm not sure that you would apply the phrase broken windows theory to well, we what was basically an open space, but um, if I recall correctly, one of, one of White's theories was that um, if you allowed disorder in a park, if you allowed graffiti, if you allowed um, uh, trash, that that would make people uncomfortable and that the barometers of how comfortable people were in the park by was based on the, the, the ratio of men to women. If, the, if it was 50-50, if women were coming to the park, uh, they were more sensitive to this disorder and exactly. that signaled that it was a safe place to be. Exactly. You actually got it close. Um, the men-women ratio is white. The Broken Windows is two guys in Boston, um, uh, George Kelling and James Q. Wilson. Wilson passed away. George is still plugging away, helping Bill Bratton now again in the city of New York. So um, we had to remove the Broken Windows, and those were uh, broken fe features like lights, uh, untrimmed hedges, graffiti, litter. Uh, all of those are noticed by women and they tend to shy away. Subconsciously, they notice this is a space they wouldn't be comfortable in. So you do get your female ratios up. You gotta look around and say, what here would 
put off a woman. And that applies to things that aren't illegal. Women won't sit next to a homeless person as uh, quickly as men do. So our solution was not to give homeless people a hard time, but to bring massive numbers of people into the park. So the ratio of people who would not scare women to those who would was more like 300 or 400 to 1. The time we took the park over, it was about even. Uh, so women didn't come. And then once women come, you know you've got a great park because the men will come too. You, you um, transformed, I don't think it's too strong a word, similar areas, uh, not necessarily parks per se, put aside jurisdiction, but around Herald Square, around Grand Central, mm -hmm. other uh, places where New Yorkers tended to avoid, particularly after dark, mm -hmm. Um, and where tourists uh, often traveled only because they had to or, you know, there was some attraction there, but it wasn't the public space itself. What does it take to make a great public space? Well, it's got to be clean and the beyond clean and also safe, which was broken windows kind of enforcement. Then it's got to be attractive. People subtly notice the difference between an attractive street lamp and an unattractive one. White light versus yellow light plantings versus gray streets that don't have plantings. So we borrowed $27 million at Grand Central with our BID there and 23 at 34th Street and built our own capital plant because we looked at the time at the city planning comprehensive plan for the city and saw there was going to be no investment in a capital plant that had really been the same since the 1940s. Uh, and once we built our own plant, people sat up and took notice and uh, began shopping again at 34th Street Better stores followed, and they spent more time in the streets. It made possible uh, Mayor Bloomberg's great strategy of having pedestrianization of Broadway and other areas. In, in the 80s and 90s, the definition of safety had to do with street crime. Uh, muggings, drug dealings, prostitution, uh, simple handbag uh, snatchings. Oh, yeah. Not so simple if you're the victim of it. We're now in an era where safety is also defined by the threat of terrorism, of somebody driving a car into uh, Times Square and, uh, and blowing it up. How, has that changed the thinking about what it takes to make a public space safe? Um, the, the crime that's left is still distressing now that people don't think so much about being mugged, which they don't in Midtown Manhattan. There are nights, by the way, your viewers should know, that there's not a single felony in the areas we consider Midtown Manhattan. It's an amazing achievement by everybody. Well, at least not at the ground level, upstairs in the maybe. office building, maybe <laughs> yeah. something different. Well, that is the crime that's left. It's uh, grand larcenies. They are defined as felonies. It's laptops and iPhones and wallets that have credit cards in them. That's more than $250 value. Um, and that is still a crime people find distressing. A woman in my office lost her iPhone coming out of a subway. Uh, so it's not as violent but it's still distressing. Uh, terrorism is in the back of people's minds. There are things going on in Bryant Park every day that the public doesn't know about that we've worked closely with the terrorism task force of NYPD on for the last couple of years um, to make sure that that area is safe. But it is, people always ask uh, what keeps me up at night. Terrorism is one thing and vendors is another. Do you think that people are more comforted by the sight of a security camera or of a police officer? The officer, um, you know, we've said to the police department, we're concerned sometimes the officers bunch too much. We'd love them to be s spread out. We don't have much coverage because Bryant Park doesn't have any violent crime. Uh, but uh, in other areas, uh, we think they should be spread out more on foot patrol. The, the reinstitution of foot patrol um, in the 90s was critical to um, these corridors of purse snatchings and the like. Uh, going in the other direction. And a, a broken windows enforcement in other ways was critical. Plus, brilliant strategies like picking up um, people at uh, jumping turnstiles. When, uh, people with long rap sheets were suddenly upstate in prison, weren't around to do crime like they had before. Or they were leaving their weapons behind even if they were... Uh, yeah, the, right. the, the searching for weapons was critical. Now you used an acronym a few minutes ago, BID, Business Improvement District, um, which is what Grand Central Partnership is, the 34th Street, um, uh, the same. Tell us, what is a BID? Property owners can voluntarily impose on themselves a tax that generally is in the range of 1 or 2 or 3% more than they're already paying very high 
levels of real estate tax. But that small portion of, of their total bill, they control by being on the board of directors with somebody like me as the day-to-day -day staff head, um, trying to reach goals that are obvious to us, cleanliness, safety, attractive street um, um, capital plant, parks that are extremely well run like Herald and Greeley Square. And they in effect have hiring par and firing power, which way they don't on their real estate taxes. They can't, if they're unhappy with Mayor Bloomberg or Mayor de Blasio, they can't go down to City Hall and demand that he be fired because things aren't being run well. They can fire me. So um, it's a very efficient way of getting the private sector to put a little more resource into their neighborhood. New York has 69 BIDs now. There are about 2,000 in the country. It's, in Bryant Park, it's a small portion of the financing model, but uh, 34th Street, it's a, a big portion of, of the money we spend, close to $11 million. When, when, the, when the BID started to be uh, uh, adopted by the mayor and the city council, again, at the request of the property owners, but it becomes a, an additional tax, there were critics who said that, um, to some extent, it was a easy way out for cities which um, didn't have to reform their civil service rules or their bidding rules, et cetera, all the bureaucracy that adds the cost of, of government, you're not necessarily bound by all of it. Um, but also, it was troubling to people that if you were in midtown Manhattan, if you were a corporate um, uh, elite, that you could buy better services and that equity would have suggested that uh, the city do a better job of taking care of all of the areas in the city, not just the ones that could afford to have extra service. Well, um, you've just described two criticisms, one from the right, I would say, and one from the left. The first one, the one from the right, I couldn't agree more. The city should still reform its method of delivering service. I, people ask, why did BIDs come into existence? And I describe that it costs me with fringes, about twenty-five or thirty thousand dollars a year on average, to put somebody out on the streets to pick up litter at the hours I want them to be picking up litter, which are generally from seven a.m. to ten p.m. at night. The city has totally different routes that are pretty much specified by the union, uh, and the cost to them, if they were doing street hand pickup, would be more like eighty or ninety thousand, so three times as much, um, and for a lesser workday. So it's just, it, I couldn't agree more with the, the criticism from the right. The city should reform itself as a whole so that they can provide the kind of services that BID areas get. The criticism uh, from the left on equity, um, I think, runs up against the problem that most of the people who make it do not want to make the reforms that the right says they should make. So therefore, they're arguing against the possibility of providing services in uh, areas that don't have large buildings to assess. Um, and I, uh, uh, the equity issue, um, therefore, uh, it's kind of a wish and a dream. Uh, but it, 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 it's, you can't demand that uh, buildings that are one level or two level taxpayers in smaller neighborhoods pay for what Midtown is getting. The best way to do that would be to reform government. So I think the left ought to join with the right on this criticism. We're going to talk about this a little more, inequality in the park funding system, commercialization in parks, when Citywide continues right after this. Welcome back to Citywide. We're speaking with Dan Biederman, president of the Bryan Park Corporation. Dan, at the top of the hour, we talked a little bit about um, uh, the notion of park equity, uh, the fact that some neighborhoods uh, don't have the same resources that the central business districts have, and they don't necessarily command the attention of government. Um, so we wind up now in a situation where uh, private philanthropy, you had mentioned the Rockefellers with Bryant Park, but private philanthropy has pumped hundreds of millions of dollars into Central Park and the High Line, both of which are for all practical purposes, managed by the people who donate the money uh, through their staffs. And yet there are parks throughout the city, uh, particularly the smaller parks and communities of color, um, that have lacked resources, they don't get the same capital investment, and they don't get the same level of, of, uh, of, uh, of maintenance. 
Should there be some rebalancing? Should some of the money that's donated for the, what I dare say would call the celebrity parks, be reallocated to the boroughs? I don't think so. I've discussed with Senator Squadron, who proposed something along those lines, um, what a, what a uh, proper solution might be. And I think the de Blasio administration is going the right direction, which is getting, uh, putting more city money in, but also asking those of us who have more resources to help the smaller parks bring more resources to their work. Um, uh, but um, I always say in private, um, the city budget is actually quite adequate if you look at it for everything. There's a $72 billion operating number, which dwarfs any other city in the United States. Parks is uh, about $370 million. That's a huge number if spent right. But the city has a, a number of what I would call above market practices, um, which stop some of that resource from getting out to the parks. People retire early. Um, fringes are enormous, uh, well over 50%, I think. Um, so the parks that have to raise every year their money from dollar one, like Central Park and Bryant Park, we don't use philanthropy, we use other methods. But um, those parks uh, feel compelled not to do above market spending deals. And as a result, the same amount of money given to, through the city to small parks versus the amount of money that would be available through different means to Central Park, Bryant Park, the High Line, is spent uh, pretty much more efficiently. So. I always say I will be happy to raise uh, money, and we're working with the Parks Commissioner. He's pushing us all very hard to help the smaller parks. But I wish we could spend it in a different manner. In fact, at a, at a forum the other day of New Yorkers for Parks, I actually said, let's have a park district like Chicago has, but with very unconventional spending methods. So the money that was raised could be spent in a totally different way just for parks. Well, how, elaborate about that a little bit. Uh, Within a park district, you would be able to start from uh, scratch on contracting pr uh, processes. Uh, prevailing wage, I've said it many times. I'm That's union rates. Yeah, for a prevailing practice. wage, uh, union rates um, on construction does nothing but deprive the poorest New Yorkers of great services in places where prevailing wage doesn't apply south of the Mason-Dixon line generally. I'm telling you that people get, uh, the poorest citizens of Dallas or Greensboro, where I'm doing some work, get much more uh, value out of their, uh, the public dollar than they do in the Northeast. And the quality of the work, the safety of the workers? Yeah, it's, it's all fun. It's, um, it, it, you, know, it, you really can either have um, public dollars go a long way, or you can spend the way the city has, I think, in about the last 70, 80 years, which is... Uh, a lot of money gets lost and doesn't get to the poorer private citizen because some favored groups are getting above market deals. I think also most people don't realize that the, um, except for projects where Mike Bloomberg decided that he was going to revitalize particular uh, parks, that um, almost all of the money for fixing up parks, not cleaning them, but fixing them up, is allocated by the city council and only when it's requested by the city council members. So if you're from a district that is struggling with lousy schools, with uh, problems with public housing, um, parks uh, may be on your list, but maybe not at the top of the list of the money that you fight for for your, for your district. But if you were one of those council members facing all of those kinds of social problems, how would you value parks? How would you make the decision as to, as to, as to whether you should put your money into buying computers for a school or fixing up a playground? Well, uh, a good argument for why parks are so important uh, is a health argument. Um, Adrian Benepe, the terrific ex-parks commissioner, was saying the other day that all you have to know about how people use parks with regard to their health is whether they go to them or not. because. I think he had some incredible figure. A third of urban exercise is done in uh, public parks. If you know somebody went to Central Park, the odds are they walked or ran. Uh, they didn't just sit. And they ended out in better shape if they did that throughout years than otherwise. Uh, so a key argument, uh, there's nothing worse for a city than people having diseases or dropping dead of, of, of obesity or whatever. Um, so council people should think about that, and I think they increasingly are. The health arguments on parks have become more prominent, and this number Adrian used the other day at a forum was uh, remarkable to me. I'd never thought of it that way. 
There's also another vehicle for um, generating revenue from parks, and that's commercializing the parks, either through the sale of advertising or through taking part of the parkland and uh, building in something in it that generates uh, revenue. Uh, Tavern on the Green, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, was a great revenue generator for the uh, for the city, famous restaurant, one of the most successful in the uh, in the country. Um, in Senator Squadron's district, Brooklyn Bridge Park, um, in part, is going to be financed by the construction of apartment buildings, luxury housing. The uh, city would like uh, to set aside some small amount for affordable housing, but for the rest of it, they'd like to get as much money as they can because that's how they're paying for the park. Seems to me that that's somewhat contradictory of the notion of why we have public parks in the first place. What do you think that Teddy Roosevelt would say about putting an apartment building in a park? I don't know what he'd think about apartment buildings, Ken, but I do know, I think, um, I was a presidential uh, studier when I was in college. I, th I think he'd be okay with our methods, which are um, very modest and not very crass. I'll give five or six prominent examples uh, uh, from Bryant Park. Um, uh, Bill Gates introduced Microsoft XP with Sting providing a free public concert uh, and Bill Gates being the MC, and then he went coast to coast, ended up in Seattle. So they wanted to do it in Bryant Park. We got a very nice site fee. Um, and the, the inconvenience to the public was if they came to the park that day, they saw a free concert by Sting rather than sit on the lawn in a conventional manner. They could sit on the side if they wanted. Um, Southwest Airlines has adopted uh, a kiosk in Bryant Park where we have a uh, singles bar at night and food during the day, and the public is free to sit there without purchase of food. That's a big number for us. Um, Microsoft, uh, I'm sorry, Google and uh, Intel have at different times adopted our Wi-Fi system. All of the acknowledgments for that are really quite restrained. They're not billboards. Most companies, Bank of America is our sponsor for our free skating in, in Bryant Park. Bank of America doesn't want a billboard. They want, uh, on the ice, there's a logo that says Bank of America Winter Village. But they don't want massive signs that would What about Fashion Week? For, for years you hosted Fashion Week. For, the, for a week or so, the park was closed yes. to the public. That was the only thing where the public was barred in Bryant Park. Fashion Week was not something we saw. It, it was thrust on us. It was good for Bryant Park in the end, but we were the ones who evicted it, much to my um, uh, uh, troubles with the fashionistas uh, and some of the people in the Bloomberg administration. But. Um, it didn't let us manage the park the way we wanted to at certain seasons, especially when they changed their schedule to be early September and late January. So we eventually found another home for them. So that was one thing where I kind of agreed with the critics. It was a lot of money for us. We said we'll make it up in another way. Bank of America, Southwest Airlines, and others have allowed that to happen without crass uh, commercial messages. Everybody can who says, uh, it's too much commercialization in Bryant Park. I say the same thing. I'm on the phone in my office. I'm looking out the window at the park. And I say, I'll tell you what, go over there without me. I'm not going to tell you what to look at. You look around and call me about everything you think is too much commercialism over there. They never call back. Uh, the harshest critics have a little trouble finding something that looks like a billboard out there because we have a design department that kind of ratchets down the, the commercial messages. There was a fight over Union Square Park not too long ago about whether it should have a high-end restaurant in it. Um, some people arguing that it was a compromise of park space. Others saying that f a food concession is uh, an amenity in, uh, in many parks, but the notion of one that catered to the affluent was inconsistent with the history of the park as a place for uh, guess. more radical speakers. Uh, I, you know, Carol Greitzer was my initial sponsor as a community board person in 1978, so I love Carol, but I really think she and her colleagues were way out of bounds on this one. This is a small facility that the Parks Department really had no other use for for, for decades. And I thought a, 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 a small restaurant in that spreading out some activity at nighttime next to the green market, which is commercial. It's lovely and wonderful, but it's also commercial was not a bad use, so I, I, I didn't really understand the furor about that. Um, and I've always put it up to the fact that I, my geography of New York is that the ideology changes as you approach 14th Street. South of 14th Street, it's quite uh, hostile to commerce. Uh, and I think that's kind of village thinking. But let's, let's talk a little bit about the future um, with um, uh, Bill de Blasio 
um, the new mayor. Um, he may have some strong feelings about some of your comments about the economics of, of parks and the labor force, but he also has a new team in place, a new parks commissioner, a new San city planning commissioner. Um, have you been in touch with them? Yes. What advice would you give them? What, what do you think is going to happen over the next year or so? First of all, the, the people we most interact with, commissioners, are police, transportation, and parks. And I must say, these are terrific appointments. We, we think the world, obviously Bill Bratton, we worked with him when he was here before. He's the best. Uh, that was a great appointment. Polly Trottenberg is terrific at transportation, and Mitch Silver is great at parks. These are great people who listen. Um, ego is under control. Uh, so they're a pleasure to deal with. So um, we, we don't agree on everything with all three of them, but when they ask us, could you do this, do that, we tend to say absolutely salute and go back to work. Um, I think it's going to be, uh, if, if these are the quality of appointments that the Blasio administration is going to continue to make, it's going to be a very good four years. And if you were going to give them one piece of advice, one thing that you think they're not thinking of one thing that they are thinking of, but they may not have focused on a solution yet. What would that be? Well, given their aims for housing and many other things and the size of a city budget that's grown to 72 billion, um, I would say make that 72 billion go a very long way. It's a big number. Uh, I think New York has to reform some of its procedures on bidding, on contracting, on union agreements. Uh, and then all of those equity arguments could potentially someday go away if that money was spent better. My thanks to Dan Biederman, president of the Bryan Park Corporation. I'm Ken Fisher. Thank you for joining us in this edition of Citywide. Send your comments and suggestions to Citywide at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or contact us at cuny.tv.